well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Here on Double Feature today, you have two hosts, one of myself, uh, my name is Eric, and then also Michael, hanging out over here. Yeah, on no, this couch. I'm also hanging out here. You get to uh, podcast from a couch, I podcast from a chair and lean over a desk. But I have to like sit awkwardly on the couch. It's really, neither Your of us Your posture is better during the podcast. I put a pillow, because of this pillow. I like to think I have a very good night and good luck, lean over the desk, get work done demeanor yeah. during the show. It's just not a visual enough podcast. Don't say things like that. People will start asking for crazy, crazy visuals <laughs> to accompany the show. We have a uh, hypnotic characters in dangerous places double feature today. We Whoa. have a, a powerful films and perhaps unlikely places, but we'll elaborate on that. I would have also taken uh, religious crazies. That's a fine. Yeah, that double was feature. a surprise. Uh, or a movie shot on Red One that are wow, great yeah. looking. We, sometimes we just arbitrarily pair things up, and then the amount of reasons to pair them together yeah. is just glaringly obvious. You know the the honest double feature for this is films whose uh, premises, titles, and concepts lie about how good they are. I think that's yeah, really the heart of I'll take today. That. When you see Red State and Stakeland, no one's listening to this. First of all, because it's a podcast on red state and steak land right uh but these red are state is that movie that around last halloween <laughs> you saw listed as a horror film on netflix yeah. and watched it no you didn't watch yeah. it yeah no you you went what the fuck is this and steak land is that movie that if you lived in chicago you saw it was at the music box for like two oh, weeks sure. yeah and you were bummed that they didn't change their roster yet so we're going to spoil uh both of the movies heavy 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 spoilers yep do yourself a favor and watch these or uh, skip over them. Use mm -hmm. the chapters, skip them. I would highly recommend you see both, especially if you're the kind of person who, say, listens to Double Feature. Yeah. Now, I also didn't want to tell anybody anything uh, last time, so I'm now going to say something I thought I would never say on our show. Are you ready? Okay. The film Red State is shot, cut, and written by Kevin Smith. Huh. Kevin Smith back on our show. The Chasing Amy guy. You know, at one point, you and I kind of went, should we give Kevin Smith a, a second chance, maybe entertain that idea? And we went, ah, sure. And you know, a lot of times we do ask, sure, we don't actually have a problem putting any fucking thing yeah, on the show. Yeah, that's true. We just don't get around to it because there's better things that we yeah. have to do or we try to pair stuff. Uh, but then Red State came up and I actually went, oh, hey, wait a second. We need to put Kevin Smith on yeah. the show because what the hell is going on over here? Um, wrote the movie, directed the movie, edited the movie, and uh, a pleasant surprise. Yeah, it I don't really is. Really, I mean, even know where to start on this. Well, I think I think one of the best places to start, at least for me, coming from my Kevin Smith background, you have a far more solid Kevin Smith background. Uh, I don't I even do. like. I'm still uncomfortable hearing that. Um, but my, I was just surprised to not see the same cock bunch of asshole actors yes. yeah in this movie sure uh, the was, actors the toilet humor the yeah there dick was jokes there was I mean, no uh what's his name jason uh jason muse yeah. there was no uh, jason although we muse. have seen jason muse outside of kevin smith on the That's show true. Before. he was in feast he was in feast uh but there was none of him there was no silent bob there was no random references to previous kevin smith films pop culture not yeah, here no pop culture tons of references but to waco and right. to uh fred phelps the the kevin smithiest thing about the film is that some of the some of the jargon was a bit hip and a, a little quippy yeah. but not in an overbearing not in a diablo cody a or joss way. whedon sense yeah yeah um it makes me sad that those are your, your i go use those i use those two distinctly because diablo cody does it wrong and joss whedon does it well oh that makes me um, feel better kevin smith does it in a uh, it uh, these words are about to leave my mouth this is crazy for us i don't even in know in a subtle way yeah, isn't in that red weird? state wow the hip stuff and the quippy characters and the quick lines are all absolutely apt to the scenes and dialogues that they fall into they need to be there that's right. the right thing for the well, moment it's, it's almost comic relief but instead it just builds a stronger character yeah the three guys at the beginning are pretty much the ones that i'm talking about here um and they Our first all, rotation of characters right. which is also great to you know 
do something uh, completely different and just decide every once in a while we're going to change characters. Sure, we're, we're going to just murder everybody. Our protagonist, and... I, you know, our protagonist, our lead is going to change. Yeah, right. And the first three guys are all quippy. They're college kids. They're the sex bunch yeah. that's out. Uh, you know, your standard horror fair of yeah, right. the guys looking to get their fucking knob gobbled. And sure. that doesn't go well for them. It never goes well for them. Yeah, people we don't like and characters we love. Isn't that weird? Yep. <laughs> I'm uh, always excited to see those kids. And if I ever met them in real life i would kill myself so here's my favorite thing about this and i don't want to go on and on you get it we're both very surprised we're uh, taken aback it's it's almost hard for us to talk about yep. red state um because we i mean we pretty openly detest kevin smith yeah chasing amy was a terrible show we made a joke out of that show it was 20 seconds long yep we said chasing amy that happened and we moved on and we've never done a kid, even the, the, the single Kevin Smith movie, uh, Clerks, in my head that I say I still like, but right. haven't watched in 10 years. Even that, uh, never come up. Here's the thing that's awesome about this. So obviously, Red State, great film, we're into it. Uh, Kevin Smith didn't just shed himself to create this movie. He didn't just go, well, I'm going to make a movie that's not me at all, and sure. then everyone will love it. You can still see Kevin Smith yeah. in here. That's the, that, I mean... That makes me so happy. The writing, the dialogue, the, the fact that you are surprised says how different it really is. But at the same time, he's not so buried in here. You can't see him. Right. You still believe this came from Kevin Smith. In fact, in a couple of the things we're going to talk about, uh, not only do I believe it, it came from Kevin Smith, but I feel like I can see his strengths. I sure. can see him utilizing things I know he's good right. at. Character depth. Yeah, but we're um, never put to use charismatic, for... Yes. You know, charismatic characters Absolutely. and stuff. These, those are what Kevin Smith has always been good at. He just puts him in shitty places. Yeah, I would say the, the thing that is the least Kevin Smith has to be the look of the movie. Yeah. And that would be enough just to make another Kevin Smith film and then make it look like it's a horror film. It's uh, it's shot on red, but it also uses the Canon 7D. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the camera because we've talked about red on a couple different sure. shows. But the 7D is uh, it's the same camera. It was used a little bit in Machete, and uh, we talked a lot about a very similar camera on the show Rubber. So if you do want to hear an exhaustive conversation about Canon, you know DSLR filmmaking, Rubber's definitely uh, right, definitely the show to go. But it's a gorgeous camera and it's cheap. And the only thing I really wanted to say uh, visually besides that it's awesome looking is that there's a certain artifact of that camera you see in this movie. If I could just make something in the movie notable that isn't Kevin Smith related for a second, you see the rolling shutter. Now, the Canon camera was mostly used uh, apparently for the fast scenes, the running around and that kind of stuff. And when the camera quickly pans from the left to the right, you see the entire uh, frame kind of make a... Uh, I don't, how do you describe that? You saw that, right? Yeah. I pointed that out to you. It's like a... Um, it's like a smudged line thing. Yeah. It's a, it, the whole frame. It's as if the bottom moves faster than sure. the top. Everything goes diagonal for a second. Now, filmmakers hate this, right? Because it doesn't look like film. It looks like... It doesn't look like anything. It looks anything. like the genie effect? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it looks like the... Uh, yeah, the Apple, the Mac genie effect when you minimize your window, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. That's perfect. So filmmakers don't like it because it obviously, you know, everything else about the DSLR says, wow, this kind of looks like film finally. And that's why people use those cameras. It's it's a film look on the cheap, except if you move quickly and then fuck rolling shutter. So there's whole communities dedicated to removing rolling shutter. Mm -hmm. Kevin Smith uses it without apology in his fast action scenes. Yeah. And I feel like for the first time I've ever seen this because I was I was in that camp, too. I hated it. It's something you always have to kind of shoot around and it's just a, a pain in the ass. But I love it. I love yeah, the way it it's used really here. Well. I love that it, when everything is chaotic and the camera's shaking around, this is just one more little, you know, we're moving around quickly. I think it looks great. Then you have the people in front of the camera. And that's another astonishing thing, uh, watching Red State. Uh, just all of the actors you mentioned are not Kevin Smith actors. Right. But all have some fucking chops. Sure. Even people you didn't really know had chops yeah. are utilized uh, exactly to their, you know, their own individual strengths and potential. Like Kevin Pollack, for example. Kevin Pollack's the best example, right? <laughs> because, well, I, think about it. We saw him at Hostage, you know? Yeah. So he's been on the show before. He has this great part that is comedic and small and awesome. Um, it's that fucking line he exchanges with... John Goodman. John <laughs> Goodman is in this film. Uh, we'll get to that. John Goodman. 
how much uh, you think across like that costs? You mean in dollars or common sense? You know, it's just <laughs> fuck it. This is the, the guy, by the way, who wrote Dogma, the apologetic. Sure. Uh, I can't fucking believe this. I've still never seen Dogma. Use of the word repeat two times is really yeah. what makes this. I mean, every little thing he does has an impact, and he's in the movie for literally two minutes is probably longer than he's actually in the film. And then his head explodes. Before he's shot in the fucking eye. Kevin Pollock was also great in a sci-fi series I mentioned called The Lost Room. Mm-hmm. That's a role where Kevin Pollock's in it a lot, and he's uh, fantastic, too. Anna Gunn, uh, Skylar from Breaking yeah, Bad. Yeah, she has a tiny role, too. She does, but Skylar and Breaking Bad and that yeah. whole thing. Uh, amazing. Can't sing the praises of Breaking Bad enough. Um, John Goodman is, we talked about him earlier this year on The Big Lebowski, I don't know about you, but I am always excited to see John Goodman. I'm I don't know why. That. I didn't I just, used to give no, a shit. No, I wasn't at all. No, about I didn't John care. Goodman. John I think Goodman? it's because he went away. Yeah. And now he's... I think why I didn't like John Goodman was because of Flintstones. Oh. That's just what I, I yeah, always... No, I right. viewed him as... Um, he was the Kevin James of the 90s in my head. Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, and he did the Roseanne stuff, obviously, yeah. too, even though Roseanne kind of had like a hip thing yeah. on Yeah, I show. mean, that's the thing is, is in retrospect, as long as I can block out the Flintstones sure, movie. Sure. He's never done anything that I disagree with. Yeah, right. Uh and I like all the new stuff he's doing. I'm a big fan of, you know, community. I'm just excited he's doing stuff again. I'm so into that. And uh he's great here. You know, we walk away um thinking, you know, remembering back as him being the lead of the movie, but he doesn't even show up for forty minutes. Yeah. He's the gravity that's brought well, in. He's the halfway. third character switch. Yeah. Yeah. He there's is. there's the powerhouse in the middle that we're skipping. We are and skipping then it the power. Switches the to John Goodman is now the main character of the Yeah, film. right. Just so I can be clear, when I said hip thing on Roseanne, I met the batshit insane uh ending of Rose. It's one of the craziest TV show. Look that fucking thing up because it's great. Uh Michael Parks. Michael fucking Parks. <laughs> Reverend Cooper. So Earl we've already McGraw, seen him. Right? We've already seen him twice this year. Yeah, we've, we've seen, seen him a lot. We've, we've seen, seen him as him. Earl McGraw. We've seen him play uh, an, a friendly Latino man. Sure. Um, we've seen him on From Dust Till Dawn and right. Kill Bill. He's Earl McGraw in From Dust Till well, Dawn. Well, in both, right? In no. Kill Bill as well. Oh, in Kill Bill 1, he's Earl McGraw. And then here he is in this. This is probably the most Michael Parks I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. Um, you didn't know you wanted this no, much I Michael did Parks. Know. I oh, did, did know, you? and I'm glad that it finally oh. got delivered to me. Oh, in the best way possible. So this is a moment where Red State kind of steals my heart a little bit. It uh, it doesn't just play in the genre, right? When I saw that Diablo Cody movie, I kind of went, uh, oh, well, she's doing a horror thing, so I have to applaud her in at least a tiny way. Right. And that's why I saw Red State. I thought... I, I didn't expect Kevin Smith would do anything notable or even enjoyable with this movie, but I thought even if he makes a bullshit horror movie, maybe he'll get to a point where he does something interesting. Right. And instead, this doesn't just play in the genre. It really is contributing. Sure. It's adding a lot of creative ideas that maybe he was sitting on for 20 years going, if I ever made a horror film, yeah. I'd put this in there. That's a really cool thing. You know what I mean? You get the introduction to the inside of this church and you get this... Uh, this long, it's not a single take, but it is a very long scene and a long introduction to that scene where you're inside a cage with a small, I'm going to assume DSLR camera. Yeah. You're inside a cage. You have no idea what's on the outside. You're as terrified as this kid is. The rug has just been pulled out from under you. You sort of knew, all right, horror movie, something weird's going to happen. These guys are going to have sex. And if you've ever seen a horror movie before, surprise, no surprise. Payoff, ever. Well, well, that, and that's usually when the death starts. That's when you start getting slammed into your friend's sleeping bag. You mean your sleeping bag starts getting slammed into a tree? We love premarital sex. So there's a big lead up to this scene, which is incredibly well done, really suspenseful, makes you wonder what's outside. And the scene itself is uh, 16, maybe 17 minutes long. It is a long fucking time. Yeah. And you feel that you're there but you're still captivated by it. Right. You know what I mean? You're aware that this is a long scene and you've been hanging out in this I mean, room a while. It's a monologue for the most part. Sure, sure. And the thing about monologues is they tend to come later in films. So when it's this early, it makes you really uncomfortable. Yeah, definitely. Because you're kind of, you're, you want to know what's going on with the movie, but instead they sit you down in this cramped, dank chapel. Sure. And you have to watch a charismatic crazy man explain why he's not crazy. And, and why everybody so else you do. 
is the fucking crazy. Michael Parks just has free reign here yeah. to just do. I mean, so he's playing Cooper, and he is, uh, oh, man, he's this incredible mix of humble and uh, paternal a little bit. Yeah. He's got this kind of voice and demeanor and warm charm to him. Uh, exactly the kind of fuck that it would take to lead a church like this, a cult like this. He uh, he kind of talks to you as if he's telling you some sort of secret, but not in a way that's cartoonish. You believe that this is a very real character, right? Uh, in fact, you believe that this is much like these characters we've studied on the on the show. I think not even so much about the obvious Waco references, but uh, like when we talked about Jonestown, you know, that same kind of here's somebody who's I mean, he reminds me of Jim Jones a lot. Yeah. You know, that kind of charisma, that kind of, uh, if you're not paying attention, you can almost feel like, sure. oh, this is our, our hero right. here. Right. You know what I mean? If you don't listen to the words, yeah, he's right. the good guy. Yes. That's exactly true. That's exactly true. And there's so much to this character. There's so many little nuances. There, the mannerisms. I mean, there are distinct mannerisms to this character but they're not repetitious mannerisms. Right. He just has a, a very natural way about him. And that's why I like watching him because he gets so lost in the character sure. that you don't, it doesn't feel like a monologue right. by an actor portraying a crazy Christian sure. fundamentalist. Right. Instead, it just feels like a crazy Christian fundamentalist. It does. It, does. it feels like you're really there. And, you know, uh, Kevin Smith makes some great decisions in this scene to stay in that room and never show, you know, he could show the cop car uh, reminding you what's outside. He could go, well, this scene is a little bit long. Maybe I'll break it up by leaving the monologue voiceover, but showing, you know, an event taking place outside. But the only uh, really kind of release you get from sitting in the seats is watching this preacher is put in a cramped cage Yeah, is in the cage. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so this whole time you're listening to this voice, this voice that's that's simultaneously warm, but also just a tinge, just the right tinge of sinister to it. Right. Well, the thing that makes it so hard to differentiate is that everybody's like, yeah, grandpa. Yeah. Say it, daddy. Sure. Exactly. It's really fucking weird. It's weird, but it's true to form. It's sure. that type of weird that makes you create a character like this because you're so fascinated by people in reality that that exist like this. Right. And that's a large part of what makes this a perfectly written character uh, by Kevin Smith. At the same time, this is still a very Kevin Smith character. It is, uh, when I say there are instances of here of Smith at his very best, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. But still, the direction at the whole time, just competing with the writing. It's as if it's actually Kevin Smith and a close friend of his competing to see who can do a better job. Right. Because while he's written this great thing and he knows he has a great actor and a great spot, he's doing all of this stuff with the camera that honestly he could just be lazy and not. You know, we talked about the cage stuff, but when you get comfortable with this sermon you're listening to, Cooper walks back behind the podium and all of a sudden they light him from below. It's really subtle. But all of a sudden, he has that kind of, we've talked on the show before about that, that underlighting, making things look evil. Mm-hmm. Um, I, maybe it's just the religion that brings it to mind, but we talked about that specifically in the Cemetery Junction right. show in uh, yeah. The Ledge. You know, you light somebody from underneath. Uh, maybe it doesn't even really make sense that he has a light on the floor behind there. Maybe it does. But it's very subtle, and suddenly you get that sinister edge. You've been in the scene five, ten minutes. You're too comfortable. Let's start to remind you that this isn't the hero. This is the villain. Right. And then he walks back towards the audience and the camera starts cutting in even closer. Now you remember he's evil and we're going to push you up close right before <laughs> all the, the violence goes down. And that's kind of a surprise to me. The just fucking immediate violence. The um, They shoot the guy in the head, in the yeah. face. <laughs> And, you know, he says this thing. There's this great part of the monologue. The content of the monologue is also brilliant, but sure. it's it's hard to just say that about every little detail of the movie. Uh, the Bible says you can't kill man. Very true. This guy knows his Bible. It says nothing about uh, killing, you know, these monsters over sure. here, right? And he goes right along calmly with this scene. He even takes a moment of of kind of silence to gather his thoughts. And even after it's been 15, 16 minutes, 
you're still right there with him. Mm -hmm. He can literally stand on stage and you're still at the edge of your seat. You don't, uh, it doesn't let you out of that moment. Sure. It's hypnotic how it keeps you there. And that says something about how hypnotic it is that, that he's keeping those people right. there. That's why that, that character exists. But enough about that nonsense. Let's talk about violence. Yeah. Uh, because I was thinking about the guy getting shot in the face. <laughs> and uh, that's, the other, that's the other big surprise for me is, hey, it turns out Kevin Smith can shoot and edit action incredibly effectively. Yeah. Incredibly effectively. Surprisingly so. I mean, okay, so there's that unexpected bit of the guy on the cross and how mm -hmm. fucked up that is. And, you know, you're it's the first real violence sure. in the movie, so it's kind of messed up to you. But uh, we mentioned Kevin Pollack's uh, character being yeah. shot brutally and, and, again, unexpectedly yeah. in the eye. It's heavy and it's loud and things just go to fuck all from yeah. there. I mean, it's uh, it's just all out warfare. The gunshots are loud. They're vicious. That scene where they're kind of back in the house or the kitchen or whatever area there and uh, just shards of the, the cement drywall right. stuff chipping yeah. off and the sound it's making. And there's just so many executions. That's there what are. makes it Left so heavy. Right. Left and it's, right. It's one thing when somebody gets shot and it's it's kind of you know red shirt esque yeah somebody runs by bullet comes in hits them they fall down oh this is total chaos sure but instead it's almost entirely executions yeah you see the characters look each other in the eyes before one of them gets killed yeah and it's all you know main cast i mean yeah. these are all people we've spent time with there's people flying around in the background that die but man it even seems like uh before he takes a moment to kill somebody if they haven't had any history built up. He wants you to get to know them just a little tiny yeah. bit so that when they die, you will feel awful. You know, a couple of the um, the cultist characters sure. go up on the roof and yep. they haven't had a lot of screen time, but let's get to know them a little bit because we're about to shoot them in the head. Right. And then we feel bad. We get back to our earlier protagonist inside the the guy with the ball gag uh, tied up. I love that um, Dutch angle shot of the ball gag on the floor in the kitchen or whatever yeah. when they, they run by at the shallow depth of field there. But we come back to him in the house after we've been hanging out with John Goodman outside for a while. We almost forget that he existed. Right. I kind of feel a little bit I just bit assumed bad. he had died. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's the assumption you make. And so there's a small moment of victory. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's still alive. And he's hatching a plan. And he and the girl get out there and just brutally executed. Just yeah. fucking vicious. Uh, in the face. No remorse about it. Turns to the agent. Is everything okay? And you you realize the the weight of those decisions that they've been making. This isn't just oh we're we're in a bad place and you know our jurisdiction and the higher command and blah blah blah. This is now we are slaughtering people individually by hand, which is about as fucked up as it gets until the climax of yeah. the movie. I'm glad you had the same reaction that I did the first time I saw this, which is, is it really? The end times? Is yeah. it really the apocalypse? You get the uh, the God sound, the single note trumpet blast, which is a crazy sound. Something you're not obviously yeah, it's really, it's really weird. used to hearing. It should be uh, exploited more in cinema yeah. because it's all sorts of fucked I up. I was really looking forward to the horseman, though. Yeah, so this is interesting because you had a very um, external reaction to this. Yeah. Immediately you go... It's not actually the apocalypse. It, it, are they, oh, the, the movie was doing. So this is the first time you've shown your hand to me. Because right. I'm showing you this. You'd never seen it before. And I'm kind of curious. You are not a Kevin Smith fan either. Right. Are you going to react to this the same way? You know, are you going to enjoy it? And this is where, having said nothing, you tell me, uh, yeah, you know, I was completely on board. And now I'm, I'm worried. And you're so excited and anxious about it. And then exactly at the moment that I had the same feeling, it's set in. You've seen the preacher do the little dance. They get outside and you go, you know what? I really hope it's the apocalypse. Yeah. Because now I'd be mad if it wasn't the yeah. apocalypse. And uh, yeah, you don't even care. It's the end times. It's totally earned that. You have come to terms with that. You know, I remember reading that uh, the original ending did actually have the rapture here. Huh. Uh, that that was the, the planned ending. Everybody's uh, chests were going to split open one by one. Uh, you know, crack would open in the earth and some angel would come out or something. I was, see the ending they used seemed like a little bit of a drag and yeah. it seemed a little rushed and well, yeah, we go back patched to the, together. We go back to the desk and it, it does seem a little last minute. It's one of those things. I mean, I go back and forth on the ending. I think uh, as much as, as I'm watching the movie, I go, wow, I, yeah, let's see the rapture. Just fucking bring it at this point because I'm totally behind it. 
I'm glad that Kevin Smith dialed it back a little bit. Yeah. Because otherwise, I think that might give me an excuse to to just Write think, oh, off. an angel flew out of the ground. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kevin. You know what I mean? That's like, true. After coming that far to, for him, for him, Kevin Smith, to show some reservation at the end when he fucking had you at the apocalypse. That's true. He had you and didn't do it. Oh, way to go, Kevin Smith. The other reason I forgive it is because it ends with shut the fuck up, which yeah. is great. Uh, preacher we've been behind the whole time singing defeated we get the soft little we think it might be another another subtle moment sure. and shut the fuck up you lose you lose and then the credits are split into uh sex religion and politics there you go so then there was the other surprise hit on today's show <laughs> and uh i want to i want to do this again without hyperbole because i feel like after building up something like red state and talking about how surprised and, and blown away we were uh, Stakeland does the exact same amount of, wow, I thought it was going to be this good and it turned out this good. It's that same increase. However, we already started at a pretty good point. Yeah. I thought this is, Jim Mickle is the same guy that did Mulberry Street. Absolutely. We saw that when we did it with REC. We did. And I remember back to that show and I almost have a sense of, uh, of warped pride that I shouldn't be able to take about this, but I do. I saw Mulberry Street with you. We adored it on yeah. the show, and this sounds almost patronizing, but we kind of adored it in a way that was, you know, oh, look look at this little, little movie. Little underdog movie does should, a fucking good job. Yeah, you should check out this little festival yeah. flick. It's pretty good, and it has some heart. Oh, this might be a director to watch out for, and it turns out it's a director to watch out. He makes this other film, bam, fucking steak lamb. Yeah. I just, ah. And then written, of course, by the, the actor who plays Mr., sure. And uh, and Jim himself. I mean, let me use hyperbole that everybody else would use. This is Oscar material. Yeah, it not is. Not that you or I have ever cared, right. but this should garner mainstream it's attention. Oscar for... material and not Oscar bait. Yeah, that's true. That's true. No, it should. It There's no reason that this film just got cast aside. Yeah, nobody's seen this. I mean, the, it's weird because, I mean, Danielle Harris is in this. She is, she's the famous one, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess second tier to Danielle Harris is the observer from fringe. Sure. And then after that is that guy from Mulberry street. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but I mean, prolific levels of good yeah, coming out of this movie. It's so fucking good. This was Especially like a, for a vampire movie, right? This is a vampire movie. Well, when year two opened and we had a couple, we finally had opportunities to do movies on our show that both of us had seen. There were a couple that we had seen 10 years ago, and we both regarded them when you and I met as, oh, this is the best fucking thing ever. Sure. And we put it on the show, and we explained why for 10 years we've been trying to tell people this is the best thing ever. And Stakeland just starts to enter into that territory yeah. automatically where it's just, how are we going to how are we gonna tell people how well done this fucking brilliant... I mean, I go back to something like prolific, right? Yeah. First of all, it does the thing that we talked about on the 28 Weeks Later show where monsters in the background. Yeah. That's uh, absolutely are the, the place problem. to go here. People are the problem. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But we also have a movie that's more an apocalypse film than a vampire film. Right. You know, you have, first of all, you have your ultimate apocalypse weapon, right? Which is the uh, the pistol grip sawed off with the shoulder strap. Yeah. So that's how you know you're in an sure. apocalypse film. But really, the the most vampire moment you get is towards the beginning, and it's uh, some of those scare shots, sure. which are really well done. Yeah. You are know, you talking they, about the time when he's eating the baby and he just drops it onto the hay? Sure, that, all the stuff in the dark and the trunk and the pop-ups. Yeah. And the vampires look really great. Yeah. And the scare shots allure you in. The sound's just right. I mean, everything about those mechanisms is, uh, it's it's proficient to say the least. Yeah, all the creature effects and the way the vampires are shot and the mm -hmm. way they move is super reminiscent of Mulberry Street. Yeah. But in Mulberry Street, there were a lot more of them and it was a lot more what's going on. Sure, sure. But in Stakeland, they're just this horrifying thing that comes up at night. Sure. And they're just one of a slew of things these people have to deal with well and something that's always impressed uh you and me is you know finding subtlety in a place you don't expect it that seems to be something every time i notice one of us is blown away by a movie there tends to be something where it it simultaneously does things that are over the top but also subtle and having a movie about vampires automatically you're over the top and you've You've, when you, uh, on a scale of one to 10, when you have vampires in your movie, you start at minus 10 already yeah. and you somehow have to build yourself back up. And for this movie, 
I, one of the subtle things it does to, again, always give focus to the vampires without having a lot of vampires in it is uh, you separate your days from nights. Right. You have these great visual cues for, you know, the way this movie looks, uh, aside from being the, the same kind of camera stuff we were talking about in Red State, is in the color. There are these, uh, during the day, it's faded, very faded days with these sort of weak blue shadows, very dry and muted kind of colors. Mm-hmm. And at night or indoors, very colorful nights. I mean, to the point where, uh, you know, there's that, the, the scene that I think is really emblematic of that is where the characters are driving, they have the vampire hanging off the car, that scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think of that as being one of the most colorful night scenes. It ends with that purple sky, the saturated trees and grass, the color on the car is phenomenal. Right. It's always vibrant in all the right parts, especially at night when you might think the, the filmmakers would opt to make it darker and scarier sure. for you to see less. But these colors drill in, you know, this is the apocalypse. This is desolation and night is the, the thing to be feared. And so that simultaneously reminds you, okay, vampire movies, stuff happening at night, night's the thing to watch out for, but there's a lot of, you know, partying and hanging out at night and staying up. And then during the day, it is the apocalypse. <laughs> So the setting is is one of the things I like the most about the movie, I think. it's uh, It manages to be desolate, uh, but more depressing than dangerous. It's not one of those kind of movies where, where um, you know, it, it treats vampires a little bit like zombies. There are a little bit of hordes of things to be feared at right. a certain point. But, you know, it's a, it's a survivor monster. We're all banding together sure. to, you know, protect ourselves from these monsters. And in doing that, you have a very end of the world kind of confrontational place where you could just talk about the fear of what happens at night. How do we pre- every day prepare for night, prepare for night? And that's not it at all. We're on a clear journey here. That's right. what's important. And the only thing that acts as conflicts to be resolved along that journey really are the other human beings. Well, yeah. And that the film gets so in depth into the different types of people that are born out of this post-apocalyptic world sure because you have someone like mister who's essentially you know he's a mercenary rebel loner type right and then he's bringing this kid around who he found um also it turns out uh kind of a buddy film yeah and still right. that should minus another 10 points right yeah way to go and then we see uh the first kind of group of people we end up seeing is the people in the town and they're all big bikers truckers train engineers and they're just kind of trying to live the same shell of a life that they lived before the apocalypse well this is another good example that town of these incredibly rich environments too you know you just want to let these places soak in there uh you could spend the entire movie easily in any one of these places they go to there's uh cannibals sure apparently we never even really see cannibals right right but we do see uh i believe what they call themselves the brotherhood sure there's Um, myth and legend of these things and and, then there's the brotherhood right and the brotherhood is essentially this uh group of i guess we'll call them religious fanatics that believe that god has brought back these creatures to do the bidding of you know man on earth and sanctify the blood of Yada, 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 vampires are a good thing. If we can make fun of religion by getting religion to defend vampires, sure, yeah. why not? Yeah, the characters feel just as interesting as the, the places themselves. Uh, you know, you want to know who are these people? What are their stories? Every single person. Sure. What is their story? In the way that Red State had people's stories pouring out everywhere, this movie, everybody's story is pretty reserved. Yeah, you never get a background. No, you don't. You absolutely don't. And a lot of times you don't get background in movies like this and you don't care. These characters are just kind of blank and that's who right. they are. But you're something about this. There's so many of these people and you're entranced. You want to know everything about every single one of them. It feels uh, extremely personal for how lonely and how, how desperate it is. And I mean, that's all before we even get, you know, Daniel Harris. Right. I, I think um, Danielle, I mean, we saw her in Hatchet and she's been in a couple she's different Hatchet things. Hatchet Hatchet 2, right? Yes, I should clarify the Halloween stuff. Right. I'm already completely sold on this, and then I see her, and I feel like she's one of those double feature champions. She is. I feel like Danielle Harris, if she shows up in something on double feature, 
we picked the right movie. Yeah. That's it's just, I mean, it's instantly a good selection. I'm kind of impressed that we haven't just gone through her IMDb page and just been be like, it. this is a good Daniel Harris movie to put on double feature. We we'll just pair, pair, yeah. we'll pair Daniel Harris with Robert England here and Robert uh, England with Kane Hodder, some Tony Todd and Danielle. I was going to say week. John Goodman. We'll just discover more John Goodman that way. Cause next, those all, all next be good. year of double feature, we're just going to pair actors in movies. Yeah. Great. We're going to list a bunch of actors we want to see. And then we're going to pick all their shitty movies. Part of what interests us about those people, I think, has to be their their intersections and the fact that they are what's vital to to one another. You know, for as many influences as I kind of feel the movie has, The Last Man on Earth that we did on the show, the Vincent Price movie, sure. stands out a lot. Just because we have this obvious problem, it was vampires there, too. Yeah. And instead, we're thinking about how people are affected rather than the cause or what it's like, you know, fending off from them. Uh, we only care about those things when, you know, that comes into play into our characters' immediate lives. Right. They obviously have a lot of complications and emotional baggage and fears that, you know, they're dealing with all the time. Our lead, oh, our lead's fucking voiceover. So it, normally I'm not a voiceover person. Right. I don't, uh, I well, don't because, like voiceover. Like you were mentioning, voiceover is usually just such a throwaway instrument. They don't use it for anything. Yeah, they don't. It's to fill in narrative gaps. Right. Yeah, we've talked about that all the time. I think Blade Runner is the thing I always go to sure. as studio wants to put voiceover in. It's not always the studio. Sometimes it's sure. just, oh, voiceover, that's a tool that's used in cinema. That might make my thing easier to understand. In this movie, just when I start thinking, as I always do, please stop the voiceover. Don't do the, especially Apocalypse, right? Don't do the John Connor voiceover. I don't want your gritty voiceover. Uh, they, they switch it up the character becomes more and more vulnerable as time goes on or in different uh, moments when he's kind of describing them. It makes you feel a lot more like he's storytelling. Like he is really recounting these things, you know, that, that happened. He's sure. telling you this story from the future and he gets choked up at parts. He, uh, by the end, he's almost sobbing. He's just in, beaten down. And, yeah. In the retelling of this story. You know, and that makes you buy the monsters just as much as anything else is just seeing how people are affected by them. But it also lets people be the danger to each other. And that's uh, that's really the moral tale when people uh, have to band together like this. The strongest thing between them is themselves. It's also the very thing they fear. Right. It's kind of crazy to look at the same universal event happen to everybody and your biggest fear is also your biggest strength is also, you know, the people that are out there. So we see both sides of that in humanity. We see the people who are banding together and helping each other and that bonding. And then we also see it tearing them apart uh, to go way back to a movie like the thing, you know, or really any of these survival movies that we do, we kind of see those push and pull elements. Sure. And then for the movie to really say, you know, this teamwork is what's important here. Uh, not something imaginary like religion that inspires fear is delivered really powerfully by the fact you're invested in these characters. So if I had to choose one thing that I think is the most impressive thing about this as I'm being assaulted with stuff I'm impressed by, I think it's how much content you think there is for how little you get. Yeah, it's true. You know, we've talked about these deep character paths. We've talked about these uh, environments. And the plot is the plot is secondary to the journey. It, it certainly you know, does is. that make sense yeah you like, eat up the journey we have we have moments where they keep coming back to the brotherhood the leader of the brotherhood ends up being the first sentient vampire there's some weird religious links in there that maybe the brotherhood's doing the right thing but that doesn't cross the mind of the protagonist their sure. their plot their goal is to survive the film can unfold however it wants to around right. them. It can seem, however, continuous and cyclical. But the reality is they're just going to try to survive every time. When in doing that, they're moving from these places so quickly that it seems like you don't have a lot of time to sit down and talk to them and figure out right. what's going on and where they've been. And you're soaking that up as often as you can get it, but you're always starving for more. It's uh, it's done so well. And I mean, to to be honest, the mark of genius here, I can't figure out. I yeah. wish I could point at it and go, this is why you feel like you're getting so much, but you're still craving more. And the movie's only so long and it's only giving you as far as I can tell. I mean, I, I think it's a few things. There's a couple really smart decisions, right? There's the things like uh, monster in the background. Don't focus on the monster. Sure. 
Um, there's the uh, the very sincere, heartfelt score, which I think actually goes a, a long way. It's that that 1930s trying to make it lonely, chin up fiddle kind yep. of thing. Stuff that you sort of see in Firefly or something like Carnival. Oh yeah, it's it's also similar to Deadwood and uh, the new show Hell on Wheels. It's yeah, it's a fiddle and a piano. That's all it is for the score, and it's it's beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time. Yeah, it is. And it takes you back to um, a time of more desolation. Sure. Maybe it's the associations I have with some of those shows, but even look like what, what we're mentioning here. We're talking about a, you know, a Western drama and sure. a, a fucking, you know, Great Depression drama and yeah. these kind of things that say people have nothing, but there might be hope if we just keep fucking trying really hard. Then you have the excellent performances, obviously. Uh, surprised by everybody just right. a game all around and then the time for softness that the movie allocates even given how fast we're moving these places there always seems to be a moment to just you know bang out a quick number on the fiddle and we'll just kind of explore a house sure. and stare into our characters eyes a little bit there's all that michael and that's not even including the fucking vampires you know what i mean you want to know the vampire mythology right you're it's not you showing you the vampire how it started your, where it started yeah, right? what started it you're thankful it's not showing you that but there becomes a point uh again to go back to red state where you kind of just go ah oh, fuck it you earned it show me just yeah. just show me you know we learn these little tidbits that kind of hint that that stuff is there that exists in jim's head he knows the answers mm-hmm. and he's, stuff like the anatomy Right. We mentioned sure. a, a lot of this kind of vampire anatomy. Anatomy is important. There's different kinds of vampires. It's information we weren't looking for, but it's information that we so desperately want to hear everything there is. Whether I Went In was the world's greatest vampire movie sure. by basically not being a vampire movie. Right. That's how it accomplished that. Yet a movie like Stakeland, I mean, they're slaying in this movie. This, yeah. it, There are vampires. Stakes. I mean, there are cheesy 80s action vampire yeah. moments. You know, there are definitely vampires. The movie just treats everything. And, you know, there's that moment with Jebediah where they exchange a couple little quips and it gets very action oriented. Sure. Feels a lot like Fright Night. Yeah. And that's still, I mean, because of the, the tone the movie has, all you have to know is that these characters feel like they get their triumphant moment where they say they're one liners. Sure. The movie doesn't know it has one-liners in it. Right. It just know it has characters, and that's how it's documentary fashion. That's just what they did yeah. while they were there, and you move on. And then there's that that fucking ending too, which is endearing. That coffee shop waitress, that sort of drive yeah. towards uh, dubious hope. Yeah. And, Canada is that's what we call dubious hope. Yeah. Right. Canada. So perfect. And you you end the movie there. That's a perfect spot to end the movie. Doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. There, and now go on. Uh, So next time we're going to do, we're going to do two foreign films. Speaking of Let the Right One In, uh, we're going to do Troll Hunter and Rare Exports. So we already killed Santa this week. Next week, I think we're going to do one better. Also, there's going to be Trolls, and we saw how well that went last time on the show. Oh my God. Watch more fucking film. Bye.